Here we go. Okay, so today I want to talk about good pagans and bad Christians. This creates a lot of problems for us believers, and it creates a lot of problems for non-Christians. When non-Christians are looking into the Christian world and they're thinking, oh my word, I thought they were supposed to be the loving people. I thought they were supposed to be the welcoming people. I thought they were supposed to be the merciful people. I thought they were supposed to be the ones following the example of Jesus who laid down his life for his enemies. He didn't uh, slander and fight his enemies. He loved everyone. He included those who were accused and condemned, cured their diseases. He undermined the hypocrisy. He did all these things. But then I look at the church and I see the church siding on the wrong side of justice, wrong side of truth, wrong side of ecology, wrong side of any number of issues, but more importantly, I see their attitudes and I'm just like, I don't want anything to do with that. I just recently had a conversation with somebody who's very close to me who said, I'm seeing how Christians are behaving online. They are the worst of us. They are not the best of us. They are literally the worst of us. So here's the problem of good pagans and bad Christians, because if you are a Christian, and you find somebody who's more loving than you, who's not a Christian. You find somebody who's has less of a temper than you, and you're like, wow, that's crazy. You find somebody who's more generous than you. You find somebody who is more, uh, just more engaged in redemptive ways with more sustainable and healthy attitudes. It can become confusing. It can become scandalizing, especially if that person holds to a totally different belief system than you do. It can make you feel real confused. And I haven't even started with my arguments. Argument one. Jesus knows very, very well what we're talking about. In Luke 4, in his very first sermon, he told his hometown people that in Elijah's day, it was a widow in Zarephath, a Sidonian, that uh, received God's grace and that they were going to miss out. He told them that in Elisha's day, it was Naaman, the Syrian, who was healed and no one of them, and that the insiders were actually going to miss it, but the outsiders weren't going to get it. And they hated it so bad, they tried to throw him off a cliff. In Luke chapter 10, he told this beautiful parable that we call the parable of the Good Samaritan, where a man's beaten and robbed and left for dead on the road. And it's the religious leaders, the Israelite leaders, who pass by saying, I don't want to be defiled. And it's actually a Samaritan, a heretic, and a foreigner. So it's like if you if you updated Jesus' Good Samaritan parable for us, it would be the, would be the parable of the good Muslim and the bad Christians. And that's offensive, except what's the point? Love. The point of his story is not pagans are better than us. The point is wherever you find love, follow that example. Come on, guys. In Romans 2, 24, Paul knows this too. He says, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. What's his point? That even God's people screw this up so bad that outsiders see it and go, I want nothing to do with that God. Let me give you one more example of Jesus. When Jesus is calling out and condemning the hypocrisy and sin of the religious leaders of his day in Matthew 23, one of the things he says, he says, you travel over land and sea to make a single convert, but when you're finished with them, they're twice the son of hell as you are. In other words, not only did you not make them better, you made them way worse than when you found them. They were better off pagans than Christians. Here's what I'm trying to point out. If you're an outsider looking in, our Bible makes this criticism. You're not inventing it. You're not the first to see it. It's not on God himself through the book has said this many times over the years. So don't feel like you can't be a Christian just because you found this insight. Our God sees our stupidity and has told us about it in his book repeatedly. Have you ever read the prophets? They're much more upset at us than they are at the outsiders. I want to tell this story real quick at the end from C.S. Lewis's book, The Last Battle. There's this man who served a pagan god named Tash all his days, and in the end of the battle, he stands before Aslan and he is so ashamed because he sincerely was serving Tash, thinking Tash was, Tash was true his whole life, but now he realizes Tash is not true and Tash is even evil, and he's standing before Aslan, and this is what happened. It says this, I fell at his feet and thought, surely this is the hour of death for the lion, who is worthy of all honor, will know that I have served Tash all my days and not him. Nevertheless, it's better to see the lion and die than to be Tisrock of the world and live and not have seen him. But the glorious one bent down his golden head and touched my forehead with his tongue and said, Son, thou art welcome. But I said, Alas, Lord, I'm no son of yours. I'm a servant of Tash. And he answered, Child, all the service you did to Tash, I count as service done to me. And then by reasons of my great desire for understanding and wisdom, I overcame my fear and I questioned the glorious one. And I said, Lord, is it true then, as so-and-so said, that you and Tash are the same, You're, that they're the same God? Oh, I love this. And the lion growled so that the earth shook, but his wrath was not against me. And he said, It is false. Not because he and I are one do I accept you, but because we are opposites. I take unto me the services which you did unto him. For he and I are so different, we are of such different kinds, that no service which is vile can be done unto me, and no service which is not vile can be done unto him. Therefore, if anyone swears by Tash and keeps his oath 
For the oath's sake, it's actually by me he has truly sworn, though he knows it not, and it is I who will reward him. And if any man do a cruelty in my name, then though he says the name Aslan, it's Tash whom he actually serves, and it's by Tash that his deed is accepted. Do you understand, child? And I said, Lord, you know how much I understand. But I said also, for the truth constrained me, but I've been seeking Tash all my days. Beloved, said the glorious one, unless your desire had been for me, you would not have sought so long and so truly, for all find what they truly seek. Oh, my word, C.S. Lewis, you get it. You get it. You get it, C.S. Lewis. Okay, so here's my application points. Number one, humility. We're not better than other people, Christians. The, our hope is by cooperating with God's grace, we'll become better than we used to be. Number two, being right is not the point. Love is, okay? And if being right erodes our love, then we've missed the point. Number three, Jesus is the center of our faith. And the point is to draw ever closer to Jesus, not to stand out at the edge of the boundary and define the boundary and figure out who's in and who's out. Number four, God's grace is beautifully at work in everyone, everywhere, always. And when we see God at work uh, through someone who doesn't share our Christian beliefs, just give God the glory, receive the gift, and learn from it rather than reject the gift and slander it because we're so insecure that that might mean that Christianity is not true. That defensiveness and insecurity is unbelief. You need a bigger Jesus. You need a stronger Jesus. You need a more beautiful Jesus. He is a narrow gate. But once you pass into that narrow gate, you find a wide and spacious land. Love you.